when you have these expectations of getting something in return for the thing that you have done. So it's one thing going to work and getting a paycheck. Of course, you expect to get a paycheck. But with love, which is, by the way, not an emotion like fear or excitement, those emotions come and go. You don't live in excitement. You know, it's not like, ah, you know, everything is excitement all the time. (laughs) And you don't live in fear. Fortunately, we don't live in fear, but we live in love. Love is so much more than, than an emotion. It is who you are, who you can be. It is walking and talking and living and giving and breathing. Love is all encompassing. This is Unconditioning. Discovering the voice within. With Whitney and Jenkins. Hello and welcome to the 56th episode of Unconditioning, Discovering the Voice Within, where I bring on guests and we talk about the inner authentic voice and the challenges and the rewards that come from following it. This week I have with me Kim Sorrell. Kim is the director of a humanitarian organization. She's a popular speaker and the author of two books. Her first book, Cry Until You Laugh, is about her and her husband's battle with cancer after being diagnosed just four months apart. And her second book, which we discuss on this podcast, is called Love Is, and it chronicles her year-long quest to figure out the true meaning of love, a sometimes funny, sometimes scary, always enlightening journey that led to life-changing discoveries that she found mostly on the streets of Haiti. I had a really incredible time talking to Kim. She has so much energy. She's full of resilience and wisdom coming from learning from her own life tragedies and taking that and helping others and guiding them through healing those experiences and finding a connection that way. And I think you're going to enjoy the journey. So here is Kim Sorrell. I've listened to several episodes. I love your podcast. You do a great job. I love your voice. Oh, thank you. Your, your voice, both physically and just what you have to say and how you say it is, is great. So yeah, I enjoy oh, it. Thank you. So you have quite a background of being an author and a founder of an organization and a mother of quite a few children, as I've read. So in order for you to have been able to, you know, be able to coach people and be a speaker, you've had to experience a lot of things in your life to be able to guide people along theirs. When was the first time that you realized that you had this inner spark of your own and this ability in yourself that you were able to follow in order to lead others? Well, that's a great question. You know, I, I think I've, I've always loved to tell stories ever since I was a kid. You know, something happened, I get so excited and couldn't wait to tell my mom or tell somebody something great that happened. And so I always like to share, you know, things that were going on. But I think probably when uh, things really changed for me was when I lost my mom. Uh, my mom committed suicide when I was in my twenties. And I realized that first of all, it was the most difficult thing I've ever been through in my life and uh, the hardest way to lose somebody. Mm. And so many questions, so many things left unsaid, undone, and it was just very difficult and no experience, of course, dealing with that. And I realized that I needed support. I needed to talk to somebody who's been through it. I needed someone to say, oh my gosh, you will breathe again. You'll survive this day and, and life will go on. And, and some of the things that, that I had no idea what to deal with. And so I decided I needed to be that for other people. So uh, I get phone calls still, that was years ago, it was 1990 and it was a long time ago, but I still get phone calls uh, from people who have lost somebody, know somebody who's lost somebody that way and they need somebody to talk to who's been through it. And so I think that was really when, uh, when it started for me was if you go through something crappy, which we all do, we all have crappy things that happen in life. We don't all live in la la land all the time. And so, but when you go through something crappy, I found that the best therapy is to be able to help other people go through the same thing. 
yeah, to take your pain and transform it into something of a positive nature. Uh, so from that experience, did you have people who like inspired you and guided you through that experience? I really did not have anybody. And uh, I think that made it tougher because even though everyone's experience is so personal and so much your very own, at the time I knew nobody who'd gone through it. And so I was just feeling my way. I mean, we all kind of were in my family and it was very difficult, it, very painful. It would have been great to talk to somebody who had a similar experience. When, when you don't have that, you feel so isolated, so alone. Mm -hmm. Like you're the only one that has ever been through this. And there's so little in life that you're going to be the only one that's ever been through it. So to be able to reach out to people who have been through something similar is, uh, can be a lifesaver. All right. Okay. So that's, so you had to get through that experience on your own. And so there was probably a lot of like intuition um, and following your own guidance within yourself that had to happen. So do you remember what it was like for you to have that transformation and that experience of getting through that pain and then deciding that you could help other people? Well, yes, I think a lot of it was because I didn't have anybody and because I was fumbling my way through and and not knowing exactly how to do it and not going to counseling like that would have been great you know even to talk to somebody maybe who hadn't been through it but knew people who had or knew how to help in in whatever way what i did run into though is uh it wasn't that much later maybe within a couple of years that i met with the first person who lost their dad that way i got a phone call and somebody had lost their dad that way and was able to go and talk to her and then started really being that resource for people. And, uh, and even now, even mm -hmm. this many years later, when I talk to somebody who has lost a parent, lost somebody um, through suicide, uh, it's a whole different connection. You know, you, you can feel sorry for people. You can empathize. You can say, oh, gosh, I, I don't know what it feels like, but I know it's gotta be so hard. But if you've been through it, it's a whole different level. Then you can talk to somebody in a whole different way. And yeah. so even now when I meet people, it's, uh, it's so good, so therapeutic to talk to people who have been through it. Yeah, so if there's anyone listening who might have lost someone from suicide, is there anything that you could tell them um, that might give them some kind of comfort? Yeah, actually uh, the thing that gave me the most comfort was not, that long after my mom died, I was listening to the radio and there was a story about a man who was a football coach, a division one football coach in Florida. So a big hairy deal, right? Because Florida is huge for football and division one, you know, one of the top schools. And so football was his life and he had a wife, he had kids, but football was his everything. And he, hopefully I'm retelling the story correctly. But as I remember it, he got caught uh, illegally recruiting. And so he lost his job. So it's like he lost his life. And he felt like his world had come to an end and he was no longer what this persona of a person was because that was his title. That was his identity. That's who he was. And he no longer had that. It was stripped away from him. And so he really believed that the best thing he could do would be to leave his family, to to leave him with the life insurance and whatever. So he spent some time getting all of his affairs in order, all the paperwork in order. He had a letter delivered to some deputy that he knew. He drove out into a remote place and told his friend, his police officer friend in the, in the note where to find him. And he went out there, he had a hose and he put it on the exhaust of his car and then ran it up to the front window and uh, shut the door, turned the car on. And he started to get physically ill. He was gonna vomit and he didn't wanna do it inside the car. So he opened the door and he passed out and fell out of the car and that saved his life. And so his friend did find him. And, and the thing that struck me so much about his story was he said that to him, it was the most selfless thing that he could do. Quite often we think of suicide as being so selfish. Why would they do this to me? 
you know, why are they doing this? That it's, that it's a selfish, selfish act, but to hear that it's the opposite of that, that he felt like he was a burden, like a, a disgrace to his family. And the best thing he could do for his family was to leave them, uh, change my attitude a great deal. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really important to like the connection of depression and, and the views of that in our society are often askew to how people really experience that. So I think it's really important to bring that up. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's different. So different than what we think. And most people don't come back from it to tell us why they did. Right. And so they're just gone and you, you're left with, with unanswered questions. And yeah. so to know, to hear a perspective of somebody who did. And yeah, true. Wish. Yeah. I have a friend who had a very similar experience to what you just described. Yeah. People can uh, come back from it. And I think that you and your experience of getting yourself through that experience in order to be able to help other people get through the experience um, is quite remarkable, especially because that's not the only thing that you've been through in your life. Um, <laughs> as you seem to have many moments of propelling you forward after a perhaps tragic moment. Yeah, it's so true. I, again, I think everybody goes through their things, but yeah, I, I often think that my life could be a reality TV show and it, it might be a pretty good one because just when I think, okay, everything that could possibly happen to me has happened, then something else happens. And so it's, it's interesting how it seems like some people go through life reasonably unscathed you know mm -hmm. your parents until they're old and gray and you know you're just rejoicing that they had this full long life and and you know keeping your spouse you're into your 90s and you're you know rocking on a porch together drinking lemonade and smiling at each other whatever you do when you're in your 90s and you're married and uh so to not experience some of those things is is different I think. Or how we're uh, expected to view these things that we're supposed to experience the way that society feeds them to us when so many people don't experience them that way. Yes. Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Yeah. So from the time you were 20 and you had that experience losing a parent, what is that time between you then starting a family and getting married? Well, I think that everything can be something to help other people. And really the, the way that I have found to get through grief or get through hard times is the best thing you can do is serve other people. It's healing. It's empowering. It's getting out of your own head and out of your own self and realizing how fortunate you really are, even though you've gone through something tough in life in general, you're awfully fortunate. And in service, there's just this great healing that happens. You know, when we serve people, quite often we think, oh, we're going, we're going to go serve people. You know, we're going to go feed the homeless Thanksgiving dinner and man, you know, pat yourself on the back or whatever. But when you actually do it, you realize that you get so much more in return than you can possibly give. And you don't do it to get in return, but it's just the cool way that life happens. Mm -hmm. And so, so the healing power of service is, I think, uh, something that's lost on people, something that is unknown, not talked about nearly enough. And service is so great for our psyche. Yeah. That, that's another thing that's so important, especially today with so many people struggling with depression and with just all kinds of things. I mean, we've got a lot to work through. We all do. And so service is a great way to yeah you mentioned getting out of your head so do you have any recommendations or ways of how to do that I think the biggest way is to not take yourself so seriously <laughs> realize that that you're just one person here that yes you're unique and special and wonderful and great but other people have been through what you've been through and if you can do something to help other people get through what they're going through or get through what, something similar that you've been through or just to have compassion and, and realize that, that you're not living in anybody else's shoes. Nobody's walked in your shoes and you've not walked in anybody else's shoes either. 
And so to get out of your head, to let people be who they believe they're created to be fully, completely them. And without us criticizing or trying to fix people and realizing that we also don't want people to fix us. But if we can help people, that's a whole different story. Yeah, I like, I like that. Don't take life too seriously. I, I agree with that. And I think that's a good segue into the title of your book that you wrote. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, it, that was an interesting path because I, uh, I was diagnosed with breast cancer several years ago. And four months later, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he passed away six weeks later. And I didn't know what way to turn. You know, my life was laid out. I, I thought I knew my path. I thought I knew my future. I was 47 years old. And you just think that you're going to grow old together. That's the way it should be. You know, you see your grandparents do it and whoever, and, and that's the way it's going to be. So it was very uh, short. You know, the six weeks was great. We had a great six weeks together, but we thought we'd have a year. We thought we'd have more time. We thought we'd have 30 years, 40 years, you know, whatever. And then narrowed it down to a year and instead just had six weeks. And, and it made me question love. It made me question what love really is. There's so many movies, Nicholas Sparks books and Ed Sheeran songs. And so many people have tried to put love into words and describe what they believe love is, but it still seems to be this, this mystery, right? What is it exactly? You know, how does it exactly work? What is it? And so I decided that I was going to figure it out. And I decided I would live a year just dedicated to figuring out the true meaning of love. Wow. Yeah. So it was a challenge. It was interesting. I used a 2000 year old poem that you hear at a lot of weddings, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, right? Yeah. And um, our eyes kind of glaze over because we hear it so often. But I decided I would take one word at a time and figure out, well, what is love that is patient? What is love that is kind? The first thing I figured out was that there are 14 is this an instance of love. So it took me longer than a year because math happened. And so, of <laughs> course, it took me longer. But uh, every single word is so different from each other, yet there's this great umbrella over it all. And I, none of it was what I expected it to be. And so many things that I was never taught or shown about love. We do so many things in the name of love that are not love. We say things in the name of love that are not love. And so to figure out what love really is, it, it rocked my world, changed my life. Yeah. So did you figure it out? I did. I did figure it out. <laughs> one, one <laughs> word at a time, one month, one painful month at a time. None of them were easy. I started out the very first month, love is patient. And I thought, oh gosh, I know what patience is. You know what patience is. Everybody knows, you know, you're not honking your horn because you're stuck at traffic. We all know what patience is. But it took me till the end of every single month to really figure it out. And most of the time I was doing it, I was in Haiti. And oh, wow. so that was a different, different place to be while, while working on this. And it would take something, some big happening in Haiti that would, uh, I finally go, oh, aha, I finally get it. Now I know. So I would look for it all month and not find it. And then the very end of the month, finally discover. So love that is patient. So I believe you're just supposed to love everybody. It's just a great way to live. Just love everybody. Just love people. And uh, love that is patient would say that this is the most important moment of your, of your life. The moment that you're spending with a person, with whoever you're with right now, whoever you're with, this is the most important moment of, of your life. What's in the past is in the past. What's in the future is yet to come. This is the moment that will come and go with or without you. And I had way too many moments come and go without me because I would be thinking about a meeting I had later that day, who I had to get to soccer practice, what I had to pick up on the way home from the grocery store. I would make assumptions about what I thought people were going to say and not really listen. But when you stop doing all that and really are present in the moment, showing love that is patient, loving the person you're with enough 
to put everything else aside and truly be in the moment, you hear things that you would never hear. And instead of making assumptions because of the labels that we put on people or what we know about somebody, you actually hear the words and you find out we've got a whole lot more in common than not. And when you really listen and show that love, doors open, things happen. And it's just a so much better way to be, just be in the moment, be here present in the moment with the one who's in front of you, the one that you love. Yeah, that's fantastic. And especially being in an entirely different culture, such as Haiti, and making these discoveries, I'm sure that had to be pretty fascinating. <laughs> it was. Uh, I start each chapter, I was going to do this journey, whether it became a book or not, if I was the only one to ever write about it and read about it, I needed to do this for myself. And uh, so I start each chapter with uh, what I think it is. You know, like when we talked about patience, what I thought it was. And then I tell the story of what happens. And I was chased by a motorcycle gang. I slept outside with tarantulas <laughs> and snakes. I, I had so many things. I got in an accident. I got lost on a mountain. There were so many crazy things that happened. And so it's not a rainbows and lollipops kind of a love book. It is the nitty gritty, down and dirty, what actually happened to bring me to the realizations that I, that I came to. Yeah. So what inspired you to go on this journey? Was there something within you that you felt like compelled to follow? Yes, there really was because I didn't know what my life was going to look like. You know, I thought I knew what my life was going to look like. And it's so easy to do, I think, for all of us, right, to just kind of assume, well, yeah, they're going to be there. You know, you get married, you're going to be married for 60 years or whatever it's going to be. And you know, unless they really drive you crazy and you decide you want out or whatever, but um, you just think that you'd, I thought I knew what my life was going to look like. And then to have it totally uprooted, we had just become empty nesters, my husband and I just, mm -hmm. and we were so looking forward to it. And I really don't know why. I don't know if what empty nesters even do, because <laughs> it just happened with us, but I don't know if you run around the house naked or, or what it is, but we were looking forward to it. We were like, oh my gosh, you know, we love our kids, love them, love them, love them. But you raise them so that they can leave. And they did. And that's good. Like, that's what you want is the, them to be independent. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we were looking forward to this whole new phase of life. And instead, this whole new phase became my whole new phase of life. And I just wasn't sure what life was going to bring, what I was going to do. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not going to ask you to go through all of the different um, components of love um, because I want people to read your book because it sounds like it would be really a, a good experience for them to dive into those experiences with you. But if you could maybe summarize the overall thing that you've took away from your experience of the discovery and mission of finding the meaning of love, what would you say about that? Well, I would say that there are some myths about love that are very common, common beliefs. And one of the biggest ones that I think is life-changing is that uh, love is not a transaction. You know, if I give you money and you give me a plant, that's a transaction. If I give you love to get love back, that's a transaction. And that's not love. Love gives, period. We don't control anybody but ourselves. You know, for anyone who's had a baby, you know that you're in total control when you bring that baby home from the hospital. You decide when they eat, you decide when they sleep, you decide when they get a bath. But then six, seven, eight months later, they start crawling and the Tupperware is all over the kitchen floor and pots and pans are banging everywhere. And you realize you have lost total control and you will never, ever get it back again. Mm -hmm. We don't control anybody but ourselves. We have no control. So if we do something to get something in return, that just leads to disappointment. That leads to frustration. You can be angry about it. There's so many bad emotions that can happen when you have these expectations of getting something in return for the thing that you have done. So it's one thing going to work and getting a paycheck. Of course, you expect to get a paycheck. But with love, which is 
by the way, not an emotion like fear or excitement. Those emotions come and go. You don't live in excitement. You know, it's not like, ah, you know, everything is excitement all the time. <laughs> and you don't live in fear. Fortunately, we don't live in fear, but we live in love. Love is so much more than, than an emotion. It is who you are, who you can be. It is walking and talking and living and giving and breathing. Love is all encompassing. And so love isn't something that you hang up when you get to the office, you hang it up in the coat closet. Love is something that is always with you. And you give love, period, because you have no control over the love that you're going to get back, but you do have total control of the love that you give. And so you give love because that's what love does. It's a, it's a one-way street. It is not a yeah. two-way street. Yeah, I think, I think that's an amazing summary. Uh, what are your thoughts on giving that love to yourself? Because self-love is such kind of like a trendy term. So did you, did you explore that concept? You know, it's so true. It is sort of this trendy term. It's kind of sad that it's trendy because it's reality. I mean, you have to love yourself to love other people. And yeah, I, I kind of think of it as like um, the Mona Lisa. If the Mona Lisa went up for auction, I don't even know how many millions and millions of dollars somebody would pay for the Mona Lisa. Well, a lot of that is because it's one of a kind. And so are you. There is nobody like you. Nobody. Nobody has ever been exactly like you. Nobody will ever be exactly like you. There's one of you. And nobody's walked in your same pair of shoes. Nobody has. Everybody has a different path. And we might have similarities. And yes, we might be in the same family or be friends forever. But nobody is you. You, you are the only you. And how special is that? How incredibly wonderful and special is that? And we like to criticize ourselves. Oh my word, women especially, I think we're our harshest critics, right? We, our body's not right. We're having a bad hair day, you know? Oh my gosh, I don't have anything to wear. I mean, there's just all these things that we put on ourselves. And the reality is you were made to be you. And if you just allow yourself to be you and embrace that, and realize how special and important that is, how exciting and unique. You are the only you. And you might not have the body of some supermodel. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? You're you. There's nobody like you. And you need to embrace that and love yourself for it. Love your uniqueness. Love your specialness. Love yourself for who you are. Then you can give love in a whole different way. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I feel like this whole uh, topic of my podcast of unconditioning is kind of like my way of journey of exploring the meaning of authenticity. Um, and I'm finding that love is such a big component and perhaps almost the same in alignment with authenticity. I love that. I've not i uh, heard that before. You're so wise. I think that that is so true. That's so true. And it's often, it's a two-way authenticity. It is allowing yourself to be yourself Yeah. and, and just be who you are, just be who you're created to be, w whatever that looks like, just, just be that whoever you believe you're created to be, uh, but also let others live who they're created to be. You know, so often people say, oh gosh, well, I love everybody. I, I love everybody, but those darn Democrats or shoot those Republicans again, you know, well, then you don't love everybody. You love everybody, but well, there's no buts in love. There's no buts in being authentic, right? You, you're not, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be myself, but I'm going to this car company Christmas party and I have to act differently. No, be you, be you. They hired you because you're you, you know, mm -hmm. you're there because you're you, you're you're with that person because you're, you're you, not because you leave your towel on the floor. You know, it's not the things you do, it's, it's the who you are, right? Right. And so, uh, yeah, so letting other people be who they are, but really loving other people without the labels. Because that's another thing about being authentic, right? Yeah. I mean, people like to put labels on, on everybody. Everybody has all these labels, but no, we're Whitney and Kim. You know, we're, we're two individual people and 
uh, just like everybody else. And so dropping in the labels, I think helps with both love and authenticity. And so I love that they do, they walk together. I love that. Yeah. yeah dropping the labels. I love that too. Um, and just allowing people to be without a label. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Why do we need so many labels? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's kind of crazy when you think about it, right? And and labels are these identifiers that can put people higher than or under you. And there's no such thing as a person higher than or under you. We're we're all walking on the same earth. Right. We're all equal. It's also interesting because I feel like in some cases labels are meant to be implemented to allow pe people and certain groups of people to be on an equal or more equal base level or foundation within society. But in a way, it ends up just labeling and separating even further. Right. Yeah. Labels are a great separator. And, and it's amazing. Like even, you know, politics is such a big deal these days and the great divide between the parties but not every Republican believes like every other Republican. Mm -hmm. Not every Democrat is exactly like every other Democrat. I mean, there's so many nuances and so many things within, right? Mm -hmm. And Democrats and Republicans can actually talk to each other because it's just two people like, like talk to each other, find out why people believe the way they believe. And uh, you might learn something. It's okay to have different opinions. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. We've made it this taboo thing, oh my gosh, you have to believe exactly the way I believe, or we can't talk, we can't be friends, we can't be on Facebook together. Well, why is that? Why, I don't get that. Why is yeah. that? And, and also to bring it full circle back to the beginning of the conversation when we were talking about depression, um, everyone experiences that differently also. Um, and, and I don't know that we really like take the time to like really examine that especially within like medicating people and just giving them only that option to get through that experience. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the words lo about love, um, and it's of course my book love is, but one of, one of them is that love always trusts, love always trusts. And that took me a while to figure out, but the reality of that word is that you take people for their word. You take them for their word. And so often we don't because I, I'm speaking for myself, you know, but because, you know, somebody says, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling and I am taking, I want to take something for it, you know, whatever. And we can be quick to judge and go, ah, are they really suffering? Are they really having a hard time? You know, were they really diagnosed with that? Are they, you know, they're not they're having it worse than I am you know, or whatever, we make comparisons, or we don't take people for their word. Well, mm -hmm. take people for their word. You know, if they prove you wrong, they prove you wrong, you know, to, to take them that way. But instead of trying to take away from what people are telling you, instead of getting defensive or, or you know, just whatever, brushing them off, take people for their word. If they say that's what they're going through, that's what they're going through. If they say that's how they feel, that's how they feel. Don't invalidate it. Don't tell them yeah. they can't feel that way. They, that's how they feel. You know, so just take people as they are. Take them for their word. Yeah, yeah, because I feel like people's reactions to other people are a direct mirror into something with inside of themselves. Ah, very good, philosopher. Very good. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's so true. That's an, that's so interesting. I uh, Very interesting. Yes, I think it's so true. And we compare to our own experiences, right? And, and so if we haven't experienced it or we want to deny that it's going on with us and we want to live in the sugar-coated Facebook world, <laughs> right? That, oh, I just love my husband and everything's hunky-dory and wonderful. Well, yeah, until you yelled at him last week because he took the garbage out, you know, whatever. I mean, let's be real. I mean, life, life is life. And uh, so it's, um, right, a little self-examination is not a bad idea. Yeah. Maybe, maybe perhaps. <laughs> yeah, so 
if people would like to read your book or, or work with you or come and watch you speak or, you know, just be connected with you, where can they find you? Well, I am literally the only Kim Sorrell spelled my way in the entire world because it's obnoxious. My last <laughs> name has way too many letters, two R's, two E's, two L's. So it's S-O-R-R-E-L-L-E, Kim Uh, But my... Uh, another way to get to my website is loveis.info. And Love Is, my book, um, it's uh, available everywhere. It's available at brick and mortar stores. Uh, it's been selling like crazy. It's, I really believe that it's love that's going to change the world. And so I'm excited that it's doing so well and that people want to know about mm -hmm. love and hopefully lives are changing. I mean, I've gotten lots of Lots of emails about life's changing. So it's it's a good thing, you know? Yeah. And uh, so it's available everywhere. It's on Amazon. It's uh, everywhere you can think. I'm on all the social media platforms, Kim Sorrell. And so I'm pretty easy to find. And I love connecting with people. I have this on my website. I've got a 14-day love challenge. Mm -hmm. And anyone who signs up for it, I will for free. It's, it's a free love challenge. And for free, I will send. Um, a WWLD wristband, what would love do wristband? Because if you can answer anything that way, what would love do? You're going to be doing the right things. I love that. So I'll add all of those links into the show notes too. So people can click on them really easily. Great. Great. Thank yeah. You. Yes. Yeah. And please reach out. I love hearing from people and I'm counseling some people counseling. That's kind of a funny term. <laughs> I'm not a counselor, but working with people uh, with relationships and love or just individuals with like, yeah. So, so like a coaching, uh, do you take co like clients one-on-one -on -one as like a coach? I do, but mostly I do in group because there's something special about yeah. five, six, eight people getting to know each other and, uh, and sharing what's going on with them that just makes it all the more impactful. Yeah. I, I like, I like that too, connecting people on their similarities and differences of their experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's nice when it's people from all over the country or all over the world. Yeah. So it's not somebody right next door. So you can just be as vulnerable as you want to with people and, and it's okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so have you found working with people internationally that love is a very universal language? Yes. Love is absolutely universal. I think it's, it's expressed different ways in different countries, expressed different ways with different people, but love is a common thread, the common thread that we all, we all have all experience. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> So I ask one last question to wrap up and I feel like I might kind of know what your answer might be already. Um, but that question is, if your inner voice had a billboard, what would it say to the world? Love everybody. Love everybody. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing when you, when you really love, when you understand love. And I feel like I've done everybody's homework for them. Like you don't have to go sleep on the ground with the tarantulas and snakes. You, you don't have to go do that. You don't have to go live it. You're in Haiti. I, I did it. You know, I did the homework. And uh, when you live love, real love, when you understand the, the things that we think about love that are not, and you understand what real love is and just love everybody, it is the freest way to live because there is no room for judgment, condemnation, racism. There's no room for any of that. And there's no room for fixing people. You know, there's no room for giving this unsolicited advice with that I was a pro at. You know, I always thought, man, I if they just did this, they'd be so much happier. You know, life would be so much better for them. We whatever. But it's it's not your job to change anybody. You're not going to change anybody. People are who they are. Yeah. So just love them. Love them for who they are. Love yourself for who you are and love people yeah. for who they are. Yeah. And there's no room for secrets or hiding or having to keep anything like from anyone either, which I feel like is quite a burden. Yes. Yeah. A heavy burden. It, yes. These things in your head, these things going on, just, just be you and 
and love everybody. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. I had a great time talking to you. Thank you. I had a great time talking to you. Thank you so much for joining me this week. If you're listening and you like what you hear, please consider subscribing and rating this podcast as it really helps get this podcast out to other people who might be interested in hearing it but don't know about it yet. And also, if you'd like to contact me or reach me, you can reach me at unconditioningpodcast at gmail.com or unconditioningpodcast on Instagram. Thank you so much. And until next time... Stay tuned in to you.